Rabbit Test is in four part, part 1, part 2, part 3, and part 4. Now look at part 1. Part 1 You will hear a telephone conversation about a car insurance claim. You have 30 seconds to look at questions 1 to 5. Good afternoon. Water Insurance. This is Janet speaking. How may I help you? Yes, hello. Um, I would like to make a claim on my car insurance, please. Certainly, sir. First of all, I'd like to inform you that all of our calls are recorded for monitoring and training purposes. Is that OK? That's OK. Could you please tell me your full name? Sure. It's Mr Bennett Fisher. OK. Sorry, how do you spell your surname? It's spelled F I S. C-H-E-R. Great. Thank you. I see that you have taken out a third-party fire and theft premium with us on a 2013 light blue Volkswagen Passat. Is that OK? Uh, yes. Well, almost. Uh, the colour is not light blue. It's light green. OK. Thank you for updating your information with us. What is the nature of your claim with us today? Last weekend, I had driven up to York on business and left my car in a monitored car park. However, it was only monitored until 8pm and I did not return to collect it until 9.30pm, after which no car park staff were present. When I arrived at the car park, my car wasn't there. It must have been stolen. I see. Were there any valuable items left in your car which could have been seen from outside? Well... I had recently bought quite an expensive radio for my car, but the front panel is detachable and I always stow it in my glove compartment. So, no, there wouldn't have been anything valuable on display. OK, Mr Fisher. Thank you for that information. I'm going to send you some forms through the mail for you to fill in. Before I can do that, I need to ask you a couple more questions. Is that OK? Of course. You now have 30 seconds to look at questions 6 to 10. Thanks, Mr Fisher. First of all, could you let me know your policy number, please? Of course. I have it right here. It's G34C245. G34C245. Thanks. And the type of claim? Shall we say stolen car? Yes, the car was definitely stolen. I reported it to the police immediately. I actually have the report number here, if that's of any use. No, not right now. But keep hold of that, as we will need to see a copy of the police report eventually. Which police station did you report the offence at? York Police Station. Was it your first time in York? No, but it was the first time I'd driven there. Uh, I usually take the train. Were you aware that the car park was only manned until 8pm? No, I, I was not aware of that. Were there any signs put up on the premises that informed car owners of the risks of leaving their cars after normal operating hours? Yes, but they said the car park was going to be guarded until 10pm, at which point the entrance is barred so no cars can come in or out. Was any reason given for that sudden change? The police informed me that the staff on duty that night had left on an urgent call. I believe it was something about a family member being admitted to hospital. Were there any personal items left in your car? Yes. Uh, first of all, there was the car radio I mentioned before. Ah, oh, yes, of course. Anything else? 
Just some CDs and an old jacket. Right. Thank you, Mr Fisher. I have everything I need for now and will send these forms out to you shortly. When you get them, please fill them out with as much information as you can and, where possible, include copies of any relevant documents to support your claim, such as police reports and registration details. Once you have returned that to us, we can then start to assess whether you will be eligible to receive compensation. Do you have any further questions for me today? No, that's all. Uh, thanks for your help. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear part of a radio program in which the manager of the Apollo Leisure Center is interviewed about the center. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now listen to the first part of the interview and answer questions 11 to 16. Next, I'd like to welcome Carol Brown, manager of the Apollo Leisure Centre. Carol, welcome. Thank you. Now, Carol, the Apollo seems a familiar sight, but how long has it actually been here? Well, we started negotiations to take over the previous Active Life Centre that used to occupy the premises mm -hmm. in 2000 and planned to open in 2001, although the usual delays meant it was 2002 before we were up and running. Mm. And do you have quite a mix of members or are you focused on certain groups? It's pretty broad, actually. There are something like 200 adult members, so that's our biggest group, but we also have as many as 100 youth members, together with about 50 family group members, and I think we'll see that section growing to 100 over the next couple of years. Healthy numbers. Yes, and we'll be developing the centre to make it even more attractive. We're hoping eventually to build in a rock climbing wall which would make a useful addition. We've already opened our swimming pool which is hugely popular and we'll have a massage room open within 12 months. Now, I understand you have different categories of membership? Yes, to suit every pocket. Blue membership includes all facilities for the member and a guest at all times, which is good for people with unpredictable timetables. If you can make it during daytime hours, red membership gives you excellent returns for your fee. As for only half price, you can use all the facilities during the day, and they're actually less crowded then. Green membership is designed for people who are only able to come infrequently, and so, of course, costs less. And there are chances to socialise. Oh, certainly. Our cafe is very popular and is a nice place to wind down and chat after working out or whatever. In fact, while it used to shut at 8, we've extended that to 9 now, with last orders taken at 8.30. It serves a whole range of food and drink. Mm. So if someone wants to join, what do they do? Come and see us. Mm. We'll give you all the details. The induction process takes about an hour and a quarter, which includes three quarters of an hour on average with a personal trainer and something like half an hour being shown round the different facilities. So we'd be well looked after? Definitely. Now you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20.
Now listen to the rest of the interview and answer questions 17 to 20. OK, now, Carol, can you give us some idea of what we could expect to get as members of Apollo? Sure. Well, let's take next Monday as an example. Mm -hmm. The early evening would begin with the programme of classes. Of course, members would also be at liberty to do their own thing. I'm just talking about the listed classes that we'll be offering. Uh -huh. So let's say you're free to turn up at 4pm. You could spend an hour in a class that we call gentle exercise. This isn't a hard workout, as you might be imagining it, but a session designed for those who perhaps are not used to rigorous classes and would like something to ease them in. Right. The next thing on offer will be starting at five, and again, it'll last for an hour. In contrast, this is what we simply call weightlifting. It's certainly not for softies, but this strenuous session is, of course, carefully monitored and we wouldn't let anyone do anything silly. Oh, well, that's reassuring. And then, kicking off at quarter past six, you'll be welcome at a class aimed at promoting better lifestyles, which we run under the banner of healthy living. We'll give you all sorts of useful advice about just living better. Oh, sounds easier than working out. And probably at least as important. And rounds the evening off nicely. Oh no, we still have one more offering. Oh. These days, so many people are working, frankly, more than they should be. And we try to combat the stress that that creates by encouraging those who can to take part in the class we call relaxation. You can learn lots of helpful techniques for staying calm when you think everything's going terribly. Now you're talking. So we'll see you on Monday. Ah, now... That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a talk by a wildlife specialist on a type of bird called a kiwi. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Auckland Zoo on this sunny Sunday afternoon and to our special Kiwi fundraising event. My job is to tell you all about the amazing little Kiwi and your job, hopefully, is to dig deep in your pockets. <laughs> Now, for the benefit of our overseas visitors here today, I should explain first of all that the kiwi is the national bird of New Zealand, and sometimes New Zealanders themselves are known as kiwis. Now, while kiwis in the wild are a rare sight, the kiwi as a symbol is far more visible. Apart from being in toy stores and airport shops all over the world, you'll find them on our stamps and coins. The kiwi is the smallest member of the genus Apteryx, which also includes ostriches and emu. It gets its name from its shrill call, which sounds very much like this. Kiwi! Kiwi! Kiwis live in forests or swamps and feed on insects, worms, snails and berries. 
It's a nocturnal bird with limited sight, and therefore it has to rely on its very keen sense of smell to find food and to sense danger. Its nostrils are actually right on the end of its long beak, which is one third of the body length. Now, here's an interesting fact. Although kiwis have wings, they serve little purpose because the kiwi is a flightless bird. Since white settlement of the islands, kiwi numbers have dropped from 12 million to less than 70,000. And our national bird is rapidly becoming an endangered species. This is because they're being threatened by what we call introduced animals. Animals which were brought to New Zealand, such as cats and ferrets, which eat kiwi eggs and their chicks. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. And so we have launched the Kiwi Recovery Programme in an all-out effort to save our national bird from extinction. There are three stages to this programme. Firstly, we have the scientific research stage. This involves research to find out more about what Kiwis need to survive in the wild. Then secondly, we have the action stage. This is where we go into the field and actually put our knowledge to work. We call this putting science into practice. And then we come to the third stage, the global education stage. By working with schools and groups like yourself, as well as through our award-winning Kiwi website, we are hoping to educate people about the plight of the Kiwi. As part of the action stage, which I just mentioned, we've introduced Operation Nest Egg, and this is where your money will be going. It works like this. It's a three-stage process. First of all, we go out to the Kiwi's natural habitat and we collect Kiwi eggs. This is the tricky part because it can be very difficult to find the eggs. Then, in safe surroundings, away from predators, the chicks are reared. Now, this can be done on predator-free islands or in captivity. They're reared until they're about nine months old, at which stage the chicks are returned to the wild. So far, it's proving successful. And since we started the program, some 34 chicks have been successfully raised this year, and their chances of survival have increased from 5 to 85 per cent. However, it's not time to celebrate Kiwi survival just yet. About 95 per cent of Kiwi chicks still don't make it to six months of age without protection which is why Operation Nest Egg is so important. And we ask you to give generously today. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a talk about developments in public transport in large cities. First, 
You have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen to the first part of the talk and answer questions 31 to 34. That big cities around the world are getting bigger is a clear trend. This situation is going to make the issue of transport increasingly important. Cities cannot work if their people and their visitors cannot move around. This means that public transport is vital to the success of cities. And yet, private car ownership is increasing all the time. Can these two facts be contained in the same reality? Isn't the car slowly but surely strangling the city? But we must acknowledge it does have genuine benefits. Having said that, the fact that car owners can escape to the mountains is of little relevance to the issue of daily city life, in which we need to do things like ferry heavy shopping and luggage around, something the car, of course, is invaluable for. But the so-called family car is rarely occupied by a family, just a single driver taking up a lot of road space. It's not only the car that clogs up our roads, of course. Trucks, are heavy, noisy and smelly intruders. But it's hard to persuade companies to opt for rail freight rather than road. They argue that it is cheaper and more flexible, and trucks are undoubtedly able to go when you want, where you want. The cost claim is false, however. Truck companies don't hold themselves responsible for the environmental costs they incur nor are they keen to calculate the time spent on repairs or delays. So, this is our first challenge, the sheer volume of traffic. If we compare three developed and urbanised countries, we can see interesting differences. The UK, for example, has just over 20 million cars, one for every three people approximately and nearly three million buses and trucks. These figures sound very high, but in fact the Netherlands, although only a little over a quarter the population, has more vehicles per head of population. Meanwhile, Germany, bigger than both other countries put together, actually outstrips either in terms of vehicles per head of population. Now, there is no correlation between these figures and the percentages of journeys made on public transport. This means that the route to better public transport use is not abolishing the car, but rather making public transport better. Not surprisingly, where people can choose, they choose the thing they prefer, not the thing they don't. How do people judge public transport? Well, a major survey was carried out this year indicating that there are many aspects, from clean interiors of buses to the proximity of routes to homes and workplaces. Fair prices is a complex issue and needs to be accounted with car costs. What people seem to find most frustrating is scheduling. If the route doesn't pass their departure point when it suits them, they'll drive instead. The issue of personal safety seems to have reduced in urgency with better lighting at stops and CCTV. Now, various measures are being taken in a number of major cities, all designed to increase the appeal of public transport and thus to persuade car users to leave their cars behind and free up the city's roads. Among these is bringing in smart cards. These are purchased in advance and mean passengers spend less time waiting to buy tickets and board buses and trains, particularly when switching across transport modes within the same journey. 
Another initiative is the use of computers in managing scheduling with greater efficiency. But such logistical measures are not sufficient in themselves, and indeed the benefits that they bring are often less apparent to passengers than to transport managers. From the passenger's point of view, the fact that buses are becoming more comfortable is significant, because it brings them more in line with the car. Delays and diversions are, of course, deeply irritating for passengers. Even if these can't be eliminated, ensuring that passengers have more detailed information available to them will help to reduce their sense of stress. We often associate public transport with inner-city travel, but of direct benefit to passengers are systems such as taxi-sharing and dial-a-bus, which provide more flexible options for suburban journeys. And finally, nothing really significant can happen without a shift in people's mindsets. The way we travel is an expression of our values about many things. Companies operating public transport are slowly but surely finding it possible to sell their services as a public-spirited alternative to the car, as awareness of environmental issues has increased radically in the last few years. Overall, then, this combination of steps and changes has a good chance of shifting the city out of the car and onto the bus and train. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.